There were times, three of them in scripture, when God gave to men the power to work miracles. There is, first of all, the time of Moses and Joshua, 1400 years before Christ, a period of about 65 years. Then you fast forward to the time of Elijah and Elisha. You're about 800 years before Christ. And there again, you have a period of about 65 years when God was giving men the power to work miracles. The next period of time like that comes in the time of Jesus and the apostles. And that stems from the beginning of his ministry to at the very latest, the death of John. There you have another period of 65, 70 years. Those were the three epochs. And in each case, it was to confirm those men as his messengers. What say you? I mean, for one, I mean, there, I have a lot of things to say, but I'll say one, once again, and this is what cessationism uh, habitually does, it bakes the conclusion into the premise. Their conclusion is the gift ceased with the death of the last apostle. But did you see his argumentation? He said there are three periods of miracles ending with the last, of apo last apostle. So your premise and conclusion are the same. Premise, uh, death of the last apostle. Uh, premise, a 65-year period of miracles ending with the last apostle. Conclusion, gifts ended with the last apostle. You can't do that. It's a logical fallacy. Cessationism is a logical fallacy fallacy. So I would start there, but there's so many more things uh, that we could say to our cessationist brothers whom we love. Uh, Miller, what about you? Well, I, I think there are times when you don't see much of the miraculous. Like we, we there, there are actually examples of that, but it's not the way they describe it. Uh, and we actually have good reason for that. Why, why did God withhold miracles at certain times in Israel's history um, or even in the times of Jesus? You got Psalm 74, 9 through, 1, or 9 through 11. It says, we do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet. And there is none among us who knows how long. How long, O God, is the foe to scoff, is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. So here we have an example of, of God. There's not a prophet in the land. Why not? Well, it's largely because of Israel's rebellion against God. Um, and so it was seen as when these things aren't there, it's because people have been rebellious and they've fallen into idolatry and they've done egregious sins. And so God says, fine, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to take this away from you because of your rebellion. Uh, we also have Mark chapter six, where uh, Jesus is in his own hometown. It says in verse three through six, is it not, is uh, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. He could do no mighty work there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So then he went around the other villages and, ta and taught. So here we have another example. It says he could do no mighty works, the, the, it's the same kind of, or mighty miracles um, there, except heal a few sick, sick people. So this is the Lord himself and his, his uh, ability to do the miraculous in this place was because of their unbelief. Again, that is a form of rebellion. And, and uh, I'm going to be kind here and withhold certain other comments, but uh, you do see that time happening. Well, you also see, like, we've referenced it on the show quite a few times, like Micah 3, there's no vision, no divination, no spirit given to the prophets who are prophesying falsely, but the spirit is upon me because I am willing to proclaim to Jacob his sin and Israel his transgression. That's in, in Micah chapter 3. I paraphrased it excessively, but uh, if you were to go read Micah 3, you would see a similar pattern where there's sin taking place, and because of sin that's taking place, there's not a spirit of the Lord that's present. There's not supernatural miracles. There's not supernatural signs. You see the same thing in the day of Samuel. The word of the Lord was rare in that day, but it was also in the day where there was sexual immorality taking place in the temple and theft in the temple taking place where the priests, the sons of Eli, were taking things of the offering that they didn't belong to them. So again, I think that we see this pattern throughout the scripture of why there are periods of time where we don't see miracles. However, uh, the idea that there is a category of time, only three specific periods where miracles and signs and wonders are, uh, are only taking place in this period, I would ask, where is your text of scripture that states that? Where is your text of scripture that says it only happened in those three periods? Where is your text of scripture that says it only happened in those three periods? And the other kinds of you know supernatural activities that we saw between those periods were not the same. These people could do it on command, but the rest of them couldn't. 
that's an argument from silence. There's no, there's no text of scripture that says that. You're just asserting it to be true. In fact, Jeremiah says the exact opposite in Jeremiah 32, 20 through 21. You perform, uh, you perform signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them to this day in Israel and among mankind and have uh, uh, and gained the renown uh, that is still yours. You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders by mighty hand and, and outstretched arms and with great terror. So here he says, uh, this is Jeremiah in Jeremiah's day, which by the way, uh, is after Elijah and Elisha uh, and before Jesus. So in this period of time where activities aren't happening. And he says, from the days of Moses all the way to today, you're performing signs and miracles. How's that possible? We were told there's only three periods of times that God is performing miracles, and it wasn't in the day of Jeremiah. No, it's actually through these long periods of time. Also, I would remind you that all of the minor prophets and the major prophets take place between Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus. So you have books of the Bible that are compiled by prophets of God who are speaking prophecies, which, by the way, are supernatural acts of God in the earth, and they're taking place during these periods of time where we're not supposed to be seeing supernatural activity and supernatural miracles. Uh, again, <clears throat> here, here's, I, I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be, a, you know, crass. I don't want to, I don't want to scoff, but I only have really two kinds, especially when we start reading all of these different Bible verses. I've got like six pages of Bible verses of miracles that took place in between these periods. But you, it feels like you have to have two two motives, um, two potential motives when trying to say that these miracles happened in only these three periods. One, um, you're motivated by just sheer ignorance, like you just don't know the text of scripture. Or two, you're willfully trying to pack certain theological language to make your point. Um, I'm not sure which one's worse, um, but I don't, I'll tell you, I just, I don't think that you can be biblically serious and say that God only did miracles through certain people at certain periods of time in redemptive history. It takes place all over the scriptures, way before Moses, after Moses, before Elijah and Elisha, after Elijah and Elisha, um, you know, in the days of Jesus and after the days of Jesus. I just think it requires a level of disingenuous to say something like that. Roundtree, you want to you take us home with all these Bible verses and just kind of yeah. crush this idea? Well, I, I think for me, thinking back on my own cessationist days, I think it's the power of culture. Uh, all That's of their good. friends pretty much are cessationists. And when you're in that circle, it's it's group think and we just think this way. And it's very hard. And and we identify throughout the film a number of wrong assertions about what continuationists believe or incomplete assertions about what continuationists believe. And that's just it, it's really hard. Uh, you know, it's like when I speak about Islam, you know, I've studied Islam. I'm not in it. It's hard to know all the ins and outs. And um, and and I think that's what happens here. And I think that what, uh, I think there's like a, um, we, we are so far like other to them uh, that, that I think there's not a deep engagement with our argumentation. That's why they don't engage any of the positive arguments for continuationism. Well, and, but I think and they won't engage so relationally with us either. Like we've, we've tried um, to yeah. actually have and, conversations. And that's certainly, yeah. And that certainly depends on the cessationist. Um, right. But, uh, but I think that, uh, cessationism is within its echo chamber that causes one to not look at scriptures uh, at maybe in a way. I, I think that charismatics can be dismissed as not being biblically serious, so we don't need to take their arguments very seriously. And uh, and what I'm saying is that's true sometimes. Sometimes charismatics are not biblically serious. Uh, sometimes cessationists are not biblically serious. And I think that in this specific case, there's not a serious investigation of the Bible and its case for continuationism. And there is a serious neglect and overlooking of repeatedly baking uh, conclusions into the premise and assuming things uh, that the Bible just never says. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, the cessationist, if the cessationists lived during the times of Samuel, they would have concluded God just stopped giving prophecies. And then God raised Samuel up. It was in 1 Samuel 3, 1, the day when visions were rare. The, the point the scripture is making there is like this was a time of judgment, to your point, Josh. It was a time of judgment, and God was speaking less to the children of Israel. But even in his mercy, he still raised up Samuel, a prophet for whom none of his words fell to the ground. And so 
but if a cessationist was living at that time, they would have just said, yeah, visions are rare because, uh, well, God just stopped giving them. Same thing uh, with if a cessationist lived in the time of Asaph Miller, you quoted Psalm 74. How long, O oh Lord, we don't have the visions, we don't have the prophets, we don't have, how long is this going to go on? And what we see is that the uh, the psalmist and the author of 1 Samuel, uh, rather than uh, assuming God has just completely ceased this and making a theological defense for it, we'll go to the psalmist. The psalmist is actually pleading for this season to be over. How long means, Lord, let this season be over. And, uh, and I do think there are some seasons in church history uh, where we see, for instance, in the first four centuries, miracles left and right. It's like popcorn. And, uh, and then after that, it, it, it never dies out completely, but it's less. And, uh, and, and I would just say there are seasons like that. And rather than drawing the conclusion of a cessationist, like, well, this is just what God did. Uh, what if we looked at our lack of experience of signs and wonders and revelations and said, uh, like the psalmist, how long, Lord? When, when will you change this? And uh, I think that would be a better response and a more biblical response. No, I, I think so too. That's good. Um, when we're looking at these um, arguments, uh, you know, Michael, you talked about culture just for a second. I think that we see that in our culture, you know, depending on whether you're conservative or liberal, there are these kinds of talking points from the news anchors that we get fed, uh, whether they're true or not, I, you know, not to get political here, but the gender wage gap would be a great one. If you keep saying the gender wage gap over and over and over and over again, you're going to believe that there's a gender wage gap. Um, however, there's not one um, or because every employer would just hire women instead of men if that were the case. So um, if you think critically about this, you kind of take into dangerous jobs, the choice of jobs that people pick freely of their own volition, uh, the same kind of job, you know, men and women are getting paid the same, but because of choice and because of uh, different opportunities that are allotted to each of these individuals, there is a difference in pay. Um, so when you think about these critically, you can actually begin to see it. But, but if you've been told the same thing over and over and over and over again, you begin to believe it is true because everyone's saying it. And a lot of these guys, you know, um, whether it's, you know, Tom Pennington from, uh, was it Countryside Bible Church, mm -hmm. whether it's the John MacArthur's, you know, all these people from Master Seminary like Phil Johnson. Um, uh, you know, you've got uh, uh, earlier we were listening to uh, Stephen, not Stephen Nichols. Um, anyway, r regardless of all these different guys that are in here. Um, uh, yeah, it was Lawson, Steve Lawson is who I was thinking of. Um, all of these guys are repeating arguments that were said by Calvin, that were said by B.B. Warfield, that were said by Middleton. Um, these are where, this is where cessationism arguments come from, and they haven't been um, renewed. They haven't been looked at again critically. They're repeating the same things, and we have scholars who have responded to this stuff. The reason that we're able to toss a video together like this uh, right after the movie Cessationism has released is because we've read those books. We've read Sam Storms. We've read Craig Keener. We've read Jack Deere. We've read Wayne Grudem. We've read D.A. Carson. And we've read The Cessationist. We've read B.B. Warfield and Middleton and Calvin. We've read them, and we've found them wanting. We, we've, we've put this theological category against this one, and we've sifted them together to see which one holds water. And cessationism doesn't hold water. And I think if you're a cessationist and you're going to be honest, you, you can say, hey, I'm parroting all of these great scholars that I love, but it's like, have you read the other side? I'd be curious because they don't engage with any of our arguments. I'd be curious if the makers of this documentary read any of our books, even one. Like, I'd be curious. Did you read Sam Storm's guide, to, you know, a comprehensive guide to spiritual gifts? Did you read Wayne Greedham's book on prophecy? Did you read uh, Craig Keener's book on miracles, his volumes on miracles? I would just appeal to you, man, if you're out there and you're a cessationist, are you a cessationist because you're in an echo chamber? Or are you in a cessationist because you're compelled that the text of Scripture itself appeals to it? Because as we walk through these arguments, it's not hard to show that these arguments don't hold water. Um, there, there was something yeah. frustrating to me about this. Uh, I, I watched uh, Les on a podcast where he talks with some guys about the film that he had made. And one of the things that he claims is that uh, continuationists, they build their theology off of experience, uh, experiences, not the scriptures, which this is the real irony of this is we've just shown over and over again that they don't provide scripture. They bake their their conclusion into the premise and then they bake their conclusions into the scriptures. Uh, but they don't provide a single scripture to make these arguments. There's no scripture that says the gifts will cease. Uh, there's no scriptures that says there's only a cluster of times where there's miracles. Um, 
And, and then here we are, we've actually not shared a single experience. All we've done is talk through the text. I mean, this idea, there's, there's only three periods of miracles and we go, really? What about these miracles that took place in this scripture? Um, this idea that there's only one, one main reason for why God, God does miracles, which is to affirm the messenger. We go, really? Because here's a scripture that says he heard their prayers. Here's a scripture that says he displayed his glory. Here's a scripture that says he has compassion. Um, the argument that we're just building our theology off of experience, tell us how we've done that so far today. You won't be able to do that because we haven't shared one single yeah. anecdotal evidence. All we've done is showed the scriptures. We also I haven't shown a thorough, a thorough reference of the scriptures. We've just kind of, you know, picked and chose oh. a couple of little sprinklings here and there. There are lists of scriptures that take place in between these three uh, supposed periods of time. And we'll yeah. put that in the and show which, notes as well, right, right. Josh? Yeah. I mean, so, like, I it, wonder if the makers of this documentary ever read Jack Deere's book, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit, where he actually goes through and he chronicles, and Josh has reproduced this in our show notes, but he chronicles... Wow. Uh, from Genesis all throughout the Old Testament, uh, the miracles that God did. Um, yeah, there it is. Josh is flipping through. I mean, it's it's dozens One, and two, dozens three, four, and dozens five, six, of miracles seven, eight that took pages. place outside of the so-called cluster period. So it is just a, an ignoring. And uh, and you know another thing because I would bet that probably a hundred percent of the makers of this documentary and the people interviewed in this documentary are complementarians. And, uh, and so are we on the show, uh, complementarians, uh, who believe that men are the, to be the head of the church and, uh, and heads of the household. And we believe this is, uh, this is what the scripture clearly teaches. And, and what the complementarian routinely says is like, Hey, it's, when First Timothy chapter two, when Paul says, "I do not allow a woman to uh, teach or exercise authority over a man," and he gives reasons that are transcultural, rooted in the creation story, uh, the complementarian says, "Man, it feels like you got to do a lot of gymnastics to to land at an egalitarian conclusion." Uh, and, and you know, well, let's look at the culture, let's look at the, and it, and it's just like, what does the text say? That's guys, that's actually the continuationist argument. Uh, first Corinthians 14, one eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. Um, you're doing the very thing that you say not to do about first Timothy two. You say, don't do gymnastics, just do the text. Well, that's what you're doing. You're doing the same gymnastics with first Corinthians 14, one. And one day you'll actually have to stand before God and say, I not only, um, I ref refuse to practice prophecy or uh, to eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially get a prophecy. I not only decided not to obey that verse, but I taught other people to not obey that verse. Mm -hmm. I created a documentary that said, don't obey that verse because that's not the word of God for you today. It only applied to them for a few decades uh, in, in the first century, it only applied until the death of the last apostle. And so you're going to have to answer for that one day. And so our, our appeal is just don't do gymnastics. Just do what the text says and do what you say you do with first Timothy two. And I actually agree with you on that, but just apply it to first Corinthians 14 one. And so I'm saying it's the same kind of gymnastics. That's good. That's good. And let's, let me run through some of these verses real quick, just so that people know that we're not talking out of our butt here. Uh, and when I talk about verses um, of scripture, if you want the show notes uh, in the link of the description, we'll have a link that is titled you know, cessationism show notes. And we're going to be updating this as we go through week to week, going through new arguments. We're going to be tossing a bunch of research in it. So if you're a pastor out there, you want to preach through these notes, go for it. You you have our permission. Our copyright is your right to copy. Take the notes, run with them, uh, preach it to your congregation. If you're a young person who's in a cessationist church and you want to memorize these arguments and, and, and you know, uh, equip yourself with these kind of biblical texts. We would encourage you to do that. We'll send them out uh, in the email list kind of, I think, uh, uh, weekly as we come out with these. Might, might be every other week, depending on uh, how frequently we get them out. But Genesis 1 through 3, God creates the world. He raptures Enoch in Genesis 5, 24. In six, uh, chapter 6 of Genesis, uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, 6, 9 through 8, 19, there's a flood on the earth, which is certainly miraculous. In chapter 11, 1 through 9, 
Uh, there's a confusing of human languages at the Tower of Babel. In chapter 12, 1 through 3, there's a supernatural call to Abraham. In chapter 12, verse 7, there's a plague over Pharaoh's house. In 15, 12 through 21, Abraham has a trance of a smoke and fire pot. In chapter 16, uh, verse 7, there's an angel of the Lord that appears to Hagar. In chapter 17, 1 through 27, the Lord appears to Abraham. In chapter 18, 1 through 15, the Lord uh, appears as an uh, the, the Lord and angels appear to Abraham and eat a meal with him. Remember, before they go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in 1911, the angels uh, blind the men of Sodom. In 1923 through 25, the Lord destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. In 1926, uh, Lot's wife is turned to a pillar of salt. In 23 uh, through 18, uh, God warns Abimelech in a dream not to touch Sarah. In 21, 1 through 8, Sarah maliciously uh, uh, I'm sorry, miraculously, not maliciously, miraculously <laughs> conceives Isaac. Uh, in 21, 8 through 21, God supernaturally saves the life of Hagar and Ishmael. In 22, 11, the angel of the Lord prevents Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. In 24, uh, 12, Abraham's servant uh, is supernaturally uh, led to Rebekah. In 25, 21, Rebekah supernaturally conceives twins. In 25, 23, the Lord uh, 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 speaks to Rebekah concerning the destiny of the two twins in her womb. Uh, in 26, verse 2, uh, the Lord uh, appears to Isaac in chapter 26, verse 24. The Lord appears to Isaac again in chapter 28, 12 through 15. The Lord appears to Jacob. So again, are you guys seeing a pattern in Genesis before Moses? God appears, destroys, blinds, cripples, pours out uh, 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 supernatural activity over and over and over again. Uh, and then uh, after Genesis, after Moses, you get to the life of the judges. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord appears to all of Israel. In chapter 2, verse uh, 1 through 15, uh, in chapter 3, 9 through 11, the Spirit of the Lord <clears throat> empowers uh, Othan to deliver Israel. In chapter 3, 31, uh, Sh uh, Shamgar kills 600 Philistines with an ox goat. Again, supernaturally empowered. Uh, <clears throat> Chapter 4, 4 through 10, Deborah prophesies to Barak. In 6, 11, an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. In 6, 36, uh, the miracles of, uh, of Gideon's fleece take place. In 7, 1 through 25, the Lord uh, sends divine uh, panic against the Midians, and, and Gideon is able to defeat them. Uh, in 11, 29 through, 20, uh, uh, 29 through 33, the Spirit of the Lord comes on Japheth to deliver Israel from the Ammonites. Uh, Ammonites. In 13, 3 through 5, the angel of the Lord appears to uh, Mona uh, and his wife, uh, who I think are Samson's parents. In, in, in 14 through 16, uh, Samson supernaturally uh, uh, has all kinds of feats, multiple chapters of scripture. Do one of you guys want to take it away or do we need to keep going? Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm <laughs> I mean, tired of reading. I think it's sufficient, honestly. I think it's sufficient. Um, uh, we we have these in the show notes. Go read Jack's, uh, Jack's book about the power of the spirit. Uh, which is actually recently rewritten called still surprised um, by the, still surprised by the power maybe. But um, anyway, so I, I think it's sufficient. And then when you layer on top of that, Josh, the uh, entire books of the Bible, the prophetic books of the major and minor prophets written pretty much not in the seasons of Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, uh, Jesus and the apostles, they were written in between these times over the period of hundreds of years. And, all of our cessationist brothers and sisters would say revelation from God is quote is one of the quote sign gifts. Well, revelation was happening uh, to these the entire so, schools of the prophet in first and second Samuel. Right. And so it seems like the cessationists are speaking out of both sides of their mouth. On one side, they're saying, hey, all the mir miraculous sign stuff happened around uh, around three people. And revelation is one of the sign gifts. You can't say both of those things because if you're counting Revelation, it definitely included all throughout. But of course, to your point, there were also signs and wonders all throughout. So it, it's just a it's it's a non-argument and it just disobey it it does not adhere to what we would call the grammatical historical principle of biblical interpretation. Uh, there's nothing in the scripture that points to this. There's nothing we, we can't look at any text that proves this or in any way evidences this. Uh, and we certainly cannot look at the author's intent and draw the conclusion uh, that say Moses or one of the authors of scripture was trying to teach us that one day these things will cease because they were all meant to surround uh, three periods of history. Like it's, it's literally, it is made up out of thin air. It does not exist. It is not true. And it does not follow the points that cessationists make. 
Hope you enjoyed that episode of Remnant Radio. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe as we come out with content just like this all the time. Hey, if you want to watch more clips from Remnant Radio, maybe check out this playlist right here. Or if you want to watch the full hour-long interview that this clip came from, maybe check out that video on top.